Tonight on the road home, the Goo Goo Dogs. We're in Buffalo. Buffalo just has this way of sucking you into it and you never want to leave. Johnny takes us on a hometown tour. Yeah. <laughs> this was the drinking wall. It takes me back to when I was 19 and the band was first starting. And we revisit the past. We're coming up on the Continental. Sometimes I think people came to see if we were going to make it through the show. Plus, we'll have a front row seat as the goos hit the stage. You, my eyes tear up up there. It's like I look down and I see people that I've known since I was a little kid sitting right there. Guitar and vocals, my friends. It's John Rusnak, and we're the Google Dogs. Uh, we've been out on tour since August 14th of 1998. Long time. Very long time. Yeah, we're going home uh, to Buffalo. It's gonna be fun. We sold out three shows at this really beautiful theater in Buffalo, Shays. And I think a lot of the people that we see, the first time we're going to see them, you know, in an awfully long time, is probably going to be from the stage, which is going to be pretty weird. <laughs> right here, I would clean the rectory for the priest. They painted up your secrets with the lies they told to you. This parking lot was where my school was, and this was the playground that everybody played in. And I wonder where these dreams go when the world gets in your way. And this is the house that I grew up in. That's the house. And the old man put those shutters on the house. And the least they ever gave you was the most you ever knew. And I wonder where these dreams go when the world gets in your way. What's the point in all this screaming? No one's listening anyway. I've known Johnny for a really long time. Johnny, you know, was a little kid, you know, I mean, he was, he was just the kid, the kid brother of, of uh, my sister-in-law. Johnny came from the uh, east side of Buffalo. His parents and his grandmother all died within like uh, two years, and uh, all of a sudden he was being cared for by his siblings, which was, you know, an enormous thing for them as well as for him. always into rhythm and music and first when he was a little little boy he had um well, he would run through the house and use a frying pan from the frying pan to the tennis racket he would take the tennis racket and wrap a string on either end and put it through the tennis racket and run around playing like that with these brush cuts and crazy red blazers he'd wear <laughs> and uh, he was a nice kid though he was a real nice kid he wasn't one of the regular get together with the boys and play football kind of kid yeah he had his own scene going on and he suffered some for it uh, via, the, <laughs> via the neighborhood and via his sisters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, then the real musical stuff started happening. When I was a kid, I always had to play a musical instrument because my parents were really into that. So I had to play the accordion, and then I had gotten picked on enough in my neighborhood for doing that. So I stopped that and uh, started playing the drums. My mother put a quick end to that. <laughs> and uh, she got me a guitar for 35 bucks, this K guitar she got me at Edwin's Music Store. 
And then I started spending my, my guitar lesson money on beer. And, and I was like, well, I had to learn enough guitar to fake out my old man, so I got my five bucks every week. So, um, <laughs> so I learned a few chords and... Uh, and off you went. And there we went. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bob Takeak, and I'm Robbie Takeak's father. And I'm Kathy Dietzel Takeak, Robbie's mother. She loves that Dietzel. <laughs> yeah, I sort of grew up in that sort of like Edward Scissorhands, poltergeist desk sort of neighborhood, you know, very safe. He was a uh, like a performer. A lot of people. Actually, he spent a few years trying to get himself ready to become a DJ, which he was here in Buffalo. But he used to have a little booth down underneath our stairwell to set up his radio station. And uh, I'd have a, a couple of uh, turntables, and my friends would be outside, and I'd be playing records and back selling records for them, you know, rocking out in the basement. Oh, my poor mother. I guess everybody's got to do something as a kid, right? I couldn't hit a baseball. I wasn't that great in school, really, so uh, that pretty much left trying to be Kiss. I think my grandma actually gave me my first guitar when I was a kid. I used to tune the guitar around to kind of sounding like a chord of sorts, I guess, and kind of play with my one finger, which led me to a career on the bass. <laughs> My name is uh, Tom Jackson. I was Rob's uh, phys ed teacher. Yeah, I hated gym, man. I just hated it. You know, they pick for teams, man. I was like one of those three that were left. Showing up was his best area. Besides that, I was a dodgeball target, pretty much. The school gym served one purpose as far as I was concerned. One time a year, I could get my band in there to do the school dance, you know. <laughs> I'm Sid Krupkin, and I was Johnny Resnick's English teacher at McKinley High School. He sat at the very back of the room, and I would go back there, and I would see that he was writing poetry. And I indicated that if he wanted to hand that poetry in to get some extra credit, that it might be to his advantage, because the fact is he really wasn't passing the course in a conventional way. Every year at my high school, I had a show called The Rock Ensemble, and you got to play in it. And that was like actually probably the first place I ever played live. So of course, every everybody in my high school hated it and started booing and yelling and stuff. You know, it was our own song. The singer got scared, ran away. We did an instrumental. It was a mess. You know, every teenage boy's got to find his riff so he can meet girls. You know, so you know. So if you're not a big jock, you gotta play a guitar or something, I don't know. John and I met in 1985 or something like that. He was playing in a band with my cousin, my cousin Paul. They were called the Beaumonts. He had me come play rhythm guitar with him. I think he was planning on bowing out at some point and having me take over playing bass. And it was actually weird because nobody told John. And John showed up for band practice one day, and I, like, I was down playing guitar with his band, you know. I think he thought I was like trying to like take his place or something. Baby's black balloon makes a fly. Almost fell into that hole in your life. I mean, at this point, it's pretty obvious to me there was some sort of destiny involved, you know, when we met. You know, I mean, we bonded just so quickly, you know. I think the thing that we knew and the thing that we agreed upon pretty early on was that we were just going to make sure that it was us. That's a bond that we really tried to keep since then. You know, so even when I hate his guts, I love him, you know? <laughs> this is so cool down here. We used to come down here. When the band first started, we would go hang out in these places. Really strange places. This was the drinking wall. You know, Robbie and me would come here and we would hang out and chill out, you know? It's a beautiful day. I heard everybody sing. Like it's intense. This is an intense spot. It's, I think it's beautiful in a weird way. It takes me back to when I was 19 and the band was first starting, you know? And uh, it's amazing because most of the things that me and Robbie dreamed about came true, you know? 
and uh, a few of the nightmares too, but you know. <laughs> Come on. Buffalo at the corner of Franklin and North Streets. And at the end of this parking lot is the uh, place that I worked for, I bet you 15 years now. So come on in. This is B. This is where we've done demos for every single record we've ever done. Teeny little eight track room. It's got 16 and stuff now. And that's got an even smaller room that we used to set the whole band up in. Up, we come up here and just uh, God spend as much time as we possibly could just hanging out and recording and learning. We we're recording two months after we were together, so now it's it's sort of weird though, just because I, I used to spend so much time in here. It's sort of like coming back to like your you know like an old apartment or something like that, you know, that somebody else lives in. And same couch, man. What has ha the things that have happened on that couch? You know, we'd have to do everything at night, so it would, it would be like midnight to eight, you know, until the suits came in. We're coming up on the Continental. I used to work in the Continental. I worked in the Continental for like, think, like three years. I was a bar back. Bud Burke was really great to me. I'd go out on tour, I'd come back, I'd be like, Bud, I need a job. Give me a job. It was really, really cool to me. You know, it was funny when we first started playing there, we'd play like Thursday nights for pretty much for free. <laughs> pretty much the only place for us to play. Because Buffalo at that time, if you weren't in a hair metal band that, that played covers, I mean, no, I had some hair, but you know, <laughs> we weren't a metal band. <laughs> the show. See, I was really hairy. <laughs> it's just a big, yeah, I've had so many bad hair days in public. It's just, it's, I'll thing. never live it down. <laughs> That's all right. The shows back then were so exciting. You know, I mean, it was a room full of, you know, 275 people who are who are just like out of their minds. Sometimes I think people came to see if we were gonna make it through the show. They were just like sort of blown away by the whole, you know. <laughs> first manager and now 15 years later the promoter for the next three nights here in Buffalo. I don't think there would be this band if it weren't for Artie. Artie was our manager for the first five years of this group and we was, it was like babysitting. Artie took such good care of us when this band first started. I mean he helped us pay our rent always when we had no money. He was like the dad on yeah, those first few tours. if we had some trouble, he always had a credit card that he never told us about that he kept in his sneaker, you know, that kind of thing, you know? You know, him being like that was one of the reasons why we were able to make it. Hi, my name is Dan Probucky, and I was the band's first roadie way back when they first started out. Oh, yeah, oh my God, oh, Dan the man, holy cow, yeah, holy cow. Yeah, Dan is, was like the patrons, was one of our patron saints. First tour they did, it was called uh, the Cram the Van Tour. In 88, we had no, nothing, we had no label support, but had to get out of the road, had to get out of Buffalo to try and succeed. 
Dan was a fr friend of ours who always helped us, and Dan had a new van. Dan gave us his van. Like, just, he just said, here, we took it for like three months, just left. Brand new. That's nuts. We used to take uh, weekend road trips to New York City, Boston, Providence, do the show, and sleep in the van. If we were lucky and I had my credit card with me, I'd get a hotel room and, you know, we'd fit all the guys into, you know, one bed. Happy, smiling, crying, upwards to my past. They had put out the Superstar Car Wash record, um, which was supposed to be the big record. thinking, okay, great, this may propel us enough to, to make it a little less week by week. <laughs> and it didn't happen, it fell apart. It looked like at that point the band was really gonna kinda call it a day. They had, like, no anything. Robbie used to clean uh, bathrooms in one of the department stores and deliver pizzas. It's definitely been a struggle for them. If uh, they didn't make up their minds to go through with it, they would have fallen off track long, long time ago. I mean, even after the success of name, they still always took that attitude, okay, this actually worked, but the reality is, in three months, it's done. <laughs> it's 106.7 KROQ and the Goo Goo Dolls. How much do you love the Goo Goo Dolls? I am their biggest fan ever. I can't say until, really until, you know, maybe after Iris, the, you know, until Iris became such a big song that you said, oh my God, this actually worked. And I don't want the world to see me, cause I don't. I get terrified sometimes to come back, you know, because it's like, I don't, I don't really care what anybody, any place else thinks of me or my band, <laughs> but here it's different, you know, here it's different. So we've been running around town seeing all the weird places that I used to hang out and stuff. And uh, now we're going to go into Shays. We're going to check it out. This is really cool. What's up? Not much. Good. Thanks, Stan. Here's the theater. Look how beautiful. I mean, like, what a palace. All the big shows came here. It's incredible. This is Grandma Goo right here. That's my mom and my dad. And this is Grandma. We're here for the big rock show. And here it is. There's a stage. Craziness. All right, I gotta go to sound check, guys. Thanks a lot. My name is Anthony Violante. I'm the music critic of the Buffalo News, and I've covered the Goo Goo Dolls since early in their career in the early 90s. All right, you ready? We're gonna go into just the way you are, just okay. like the show, okay? The first time I saw them was in a little record shop, and you know, I could never predict they'd be this big. up there. I, I can't help it, man. It's like I look down and I see people 
that I've known since I was a little kid. A little kid, you know, sitting right there. You know, they're, they're 50 years old and they're five years old, and they're equally as excited. Just like goes right through your skin, you know, it's amazing. That's how we run away. that I hung out. That's the, the bricks and the mortar and all that that I'm made out of. And that's, and I'm proud of that. I'm really, really proud of that. Buffalo just has this way of sucking you into it and you never want to leave. 